Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Perhaps one of the most famous and often cited passages from Immanuel Kant's short work, The Prolegomena to Any Future Metaphysics, has to do with his relationship to David Hume. And it reads like this. I openly confess that my remembering or recalling David Hume was the very thing which many years ago first interrupted my dogmatic slumber and gave my investigations in the field of speculative philosophy a quite new direction, a new rectum, right? And actually, quite is a bit of an understatement there, an entirely new direction, you know? So David Hume is responsible for Kant leaving this soporific state. What does he mean by a dogmatic slumber? So dogmatic meaning committed to a particular philosophical system that remained rather unquestioned. David Hume comes along, Kant encounters his works and is like, oh, wow, this shakes things up. You know, to use one of those tropes that people love today, this changes everything, right? So he's having one of those sorts of moments. And so we could say, okay, well, what is... Hume's contribution here. How did Hume jar Immanuel Kant out of this complacency, this sleepiness, this schlummer, right, in German? And so he's going to tell us. He's quite clear about this. He says, Hume started mainly from a single but important concept, a begriff in metaphysics, namely that of the connection between cause and effect. Ursache, the thing that you know, lies behind, that, that uh, is prior, you could say, and Wirkung, the thing that, that comes to be from the cause. And if you want to see Hume deconstructing this, well, you can look at the treatise, uh, you know, the early work, or you can look at, which more people typically do, the um, you know, inquiry concerning human understanding. And there, it's very, very well articulated at great length, and Hume goes into considerable depth in both of those works. So Hume is investigating cause and effect, and you know, as uh, as Kant is going to point out, this not only has to do with cause and effect, but also derivative concepts like force or action, things that play a role in the natural sciences, which are going to be talked about quite a bit later on in this work. And so he says, uh, Hume challenged reason, which pretends to have given birth to this concept of herself, to answer him by what right she thinks anything could be so constituted that if that thing be posited, something else must necessarily be posited. This is the meaning of cause. So cause and effect You've got a constant conjunction or connection, as Hume would say. So there's this relation where if you get the cause, then the effect necessarily follows and is produced. And this is the basis of lots and lots of reasoning, particularly metaphysical reasoning. Now, can reason actually derive this by itself? Previous metaphysicians said yes. They actually said, well, you can know a lot about a cause by looking at its effects. In fact, that there has to be a cause. And what happens in the effect, some would say, is derived from the cause, right? 
So this is a staple of previous metaphysics. And then he goes on and uh, Kant says that Hume demonstrated irrefutably it was entirely impossible for reason to think a priori, so without any reference to experience, and by means of concepts, begriffen, right, such a combination as involves necessity. And that is part of the notion of cause as well. So if we're not getting our, our understanding, our notion, our concept of cause from reason, developing it on its own, without reference to experience, then where is it coming from? And so uh, Hume, according to Kant, is going to um, you know, infer that reason was deluded with reference to this concept. It, reason believes this concept, cause and effect, to be one of her children, to be something that reason has itself produced, when in reality, something else has happened. It's actually a bastard of imagination. Now, what is a bastard? We often use that term today to mean somebody who's a jerk. In this context, in that time, it means an illegitimate child. So reason has been cuckolded, you could say, by imagination, right? Imagination produced this thing and snuck it into reason's nest, you know, house and said, this is, this is your kid, right? And reason was like, oh, okay, sounds good. Now, not only is it a bastard child of imagination, that bastard child wasn't even impregnated by reason, it was impregnated by experience. And this is a very striking analogy, but what is Kant really getting at here? He says that um, it subsumed certain representations under the law of association. So the law of association, Hume develops this in the treatise, develops it further in the inquiry, right? And the, the associations are that we put these things together that either resemble each other or are contiguous or are in this relationship of constant conjunction, cause and effect, right? Or at least have probability to them where we see it 99 times out of 100, something like that. And the law of association is a psychological law. Uh, Hume doesn't actually call this a law. This is more Kantian than, than Humean, this, this interpretation. But the idea is that we cannot help but associate these things with each other. And we do so on the basis of experience. And Kant is going to invoke a term that Hume makes a lot out of, custom. So we develop these customs, these habits of associating certain things with each other. Like, you know, I poke myself in the eye, it hurts. I learn don't poke myself in the eye. If I want to figure out whether it hurts some more, I can poke somebody else in the eye. I can poke myself in the eye and it keeps on hurting. And, you know, at a certain point, probably it's not a good idea to keep doing that because you're going to run out of eyeball to keep poking. But be that as it may, you're establishing a constant conjunction. But there isn't any true metaphysical cause and effect there. There's just a bunch of things that are kind of connected together in our experience. And so he says it mistook a subjective necessity, namely custom, for an objective necessity arising from insight. And so what is Hume's conclusion here? He says, reason has no power to think such connections, even in general, because their concepts would be purely fictitious and all these pretended a priori cognitions, nothing but common experiences, marked with a false stamp. So what is the conclusion to this? Which, by the way, Kant doesn't agree with, um, at least in totality. He says, this is as much to say that there is not and cannot be any such thing as metaphysics at all. So as Geba, there is no metaphysics, kind of metaphysique right now. Okay, uh, Hume, or Kant actually does think that's the case. What we're calling metaphysics in the present, at the time that he's writing, is not truly metaphysics. Hume is demonstrating that that's the case, at least with cause and effect, which is an absolutely central concept 
for metaphysics. But Hume is going on to say that there cannot be any metaphysics at all. So in a way, Hume is less skeptical and more dogmatic about that. And Kant is going to say, well, you know, until Hume's challenge has adequately been met, we don't really have metaphysics. So Hume is doing an incredible service. This is why he awakens Kant from his dogmatic slumber in showing that all the metaphysics up to this time that is relying on cause and effect is going to be problematic. And he says, Hume suffered the usual misfortune of metaphysicians of not being understood. And he mentions critics or you know, opponents, Gegner, uh, the, you know, opposites, you know, uh, we could say nemesis if you want, Reed, Oswald, Beattie, and lastly, Priestley. And he says they always, they miss the point of the problem. And how did they do so? Well, they turned the question into one about the rightness, the, you know, richtig, or about the usefulness or indispensability of the notion of cause and effect. And Hume actually isn't disputing that, as Kant points out. If you read Hume's inquiry, you'll notice that he says, yeah, we can't help but think this way. You know, I'm just telling you that these things about cause and effect, um, although they are useful, there's no ultimate reality that they're based upon, right? And so um, he, uh, Kant goes on and he says, whether that concept could be thought by reason a priori and consequently whether it possessed an inner truth independent of all experience, implying a more widely extended usefulness and uh, universal uh, usefulness, not limited merely to objects of experience. This was Hume's problem. It was a question concerning the origin, the Ursprung of the concept. Not about whether we need the concept, not about whether it's useful to have cause and effect, but what really is at its basis. And so all of these opponents or critics of Hume are kind of missing the point. Now, Kant criticizes them for another reason as well, and this is the appeal to common sense, which was quite common among the uh, critics of Hume. And common sense mentioned Verstand. Quite literally, it means the understanding, the Verstand of human beings, and so it's understood to be something that we all more or less share in common. I mean, sometimes we say somebody lacks common sense or they're going against common sense. And in, in his first instance of it, he calls it Gemeine Menschen Verstand. So Gemeine, you know, something that we share in common with each other, a communal uh, human understanding. And so he says that they found... Um, a more convenient method of being defiant without insight, the appeal to common sense. It is indeed a great gift of heaven to possess right, or as they now call it, plain common sense. But this common sense must be shown in deeds, well-considered and reasonable thoughts and words, not by appealing to it as an oracle when no rational justification of oneself can be advanced. To appeal to common sense when insight and science fail this is one of the subtle discoveries of modern times by means of which the most superficial ranter can safely enter the list with the most thorough thinker and hold his own. And, and, you know, as a side note, we see people appealing to this today, right? Common sense, interestingly, it's not only been used for a long, long time, but you see it used quite a lot as a catchphrase, at least in American context, by people on the right wing who want to think that they possess common sense and they deploy common sense and these liberals or communists or pick whoever else, not common sense, not they're, they're elites and we're the ordinary people. And Kant would look at that and be like, well, first of all, how do you know that what you're actually talking about is common sense? A lot of the stuff that you're saying is actually nonsense. This is one of the problems with people who talk about common sense. Their common sense may not actually be that common, let alone universal. 
Uh, and that should make them think, oh, maybe I've got things wrong <laughs> rather than trying to use it as uh, a polemical tool. And that, that's in fact what, not in political terms, but in terms of making sense of causality, what, what Hume's critics are doing. Common sense solves these problems. And, you know, Kant points out, do you think Hume doesn't have any common sense? He's got just as much common sense as you guys do. Plus, he's also got more things at his disposal, right? He says, I should think Hume might fairly have laid as much claim to common sense as Beattie did, and in addition to a critical reason such as the latter did not possess, which keeps common sense in check and prevents it from speculating, or if speculations are under discussion, restrains the desire to decide because it cannot satisfy itself concerning its own principles, by this means alone can common sense remain sound. So he's saying, listen, appeal to common sense if you want to, but you're basically showing yourself to be an ignoramus by doing that, not really a philosopher, let alone somebody who's, who's competent to say anything about metaphysics. So he takes Hume's challenge very, very seriously. And in fact, as Kant is going to tell us, he is going to use Hume's challenge against itself in a certain way to see whether we can actually have metaphysics. He tells us, I tried first whether Hume's objection could not be put into a general form. Now, what do we mean by a general form here? So Hume is talking about cause and effect in general, but he's not talking about all concepts that metaphysics uses, just cause and effect, right? So could we do this with all of the concepts of metaphysics? And what is Hume's objection? Well, we're not getting these from reason. We are getting these from somewhere else. So he says that I soon found by actually doing this, the concept of the connection of cause and effect was by no means the only concept by which the understanding thinks the connection of things a priori, but rather that metaphysics consists altogether of such concepts. I sought to ascertain their number when I had satisfactorily succeeded in this by starting from a single principle. I proceeded to the deduction of these concepts. And that is what the first critique is actually doing. So without Kant shaking things up, saying, oh, we got a really genuine problem here about cause and effect, Kant is saying, I probably would not have been spurred to do the work that I did that eventually culminates in the first critique, uh, taking Kant's or taking Hume's problem so seriously that he thinks I need to generalize this and go even further. This is part of the radical reform and rebirth of metaphysics that Kant refers to a little bit earlier in the prolegomena here in the preface. So Hume is doing an indispensable service according to Kant. Uh, Kant doesn't buy into everything that Hume is saying, but he certainly is willing to use Hume's ideas as a starting point for his own investigations in speculative philosophy.